So my research links economy-wide disasters to asset prices, like stock prices, for example. Um, this is research that I, along with others, have been pursuing uh, recently. Say it's, it's really um, taken off over the last five years, and it's certainly gotten a boost from the financial crisis. Uh, and th in this research, um, part of it draws on historical data on consumption disasters from the United States and from elsewhere in the world. An example of a consumption disaster is the Great Depression, where consumption fell by 20 percent. Um, but that's actually a relatively minor disaster. If you look at Europe, um, after the Second World War, many countries had economies that contracted by as much as 50 percent. Um, if stock prices fall in the event of a disaster, then that is an important risk that investors take into account, and that can explain why, in normal times, we have such high returns on stock prices, which has long been a puzzle. It can also explain why stock prices are so volatile, because this risk is hard to calculate and very hard to measure, and as investors' perceptions of it move around, that can move around stock prices. So the first takeaway is that the world is risky, that there are, there are these risks for consumption disasters, and they are, that's reflected in stock prices. And that's why we see such a high realized return during normal times when we don't have disasters. Also, one of the reasons that stock returns are so volatile is because of these fears of a disaster. Now, you might think of these fears as overreaction, because often the disaster doesn't happen. However, is it overreaction, or do people really have a reason to be afraid? Certainly in 2008, it seemed like we had a reason to be afraid. Well, stock market volatility has been a puzzle for a long time. So what surprised me is that when we put the, um, this international data from disasters into a model, that this really could explain the magnitudes of stock market volatility that we see. Part of it is investors' risk aversion. So when you have numbers like even a small probability of a 50 percent decline or even a 20 percent decline, that really influences investors' behavior. Unfortunately, I think some people have a wishful thinking view of the stock market, that if you just hold on long enough, that you're guaranteed to get some of the high rates of return that we've measured over the post-war period, these rates of return being 12 percent, that this is just something you're going to get if you keep holding stocks. Well, that may not be true. Now, this is not a measure that investors shouldn't hold stocks. I, I hold stocks, and I think for investors who have positive net worth, stocks are an important part of the portfolio. But in evaluating the risk, they could go down and they might not come back up. So one of them is for investors, that investors should be aware that stocks are risky um, that, and that the return is not guaranteed. What this means um, is not that you shouldn't hold stocks. It's just that given that stocks might go down, holding stocks in, say, an environment where you also have leverage is, is putting yourself under a certain amount of risk. Leverage could include um, a mortgage. Leverage might include a job or employment of some kind where your income is very much um, subject to the stock market. Those might be reasons to limit the stock market part, the stock part of your portfolio, beyond what, say, just these wonderful expected returns would indicate. That's number one. Number two, these concerns about rare disasters have been part of what's been pricing stocks for a long time. And to me, that suggests caution on the part of regulators, um, because I think it's just going to be very hard to eliminate this risk. Part of what might be driving events like 2008 are fears about future growth prospects. And those, that, those kind of fears are very hard to eliminate. So if you can't eliminate those fears, you can make the economy less risky by, say, um, having less leverage on the part of financial institutions. 
people have been researching the stock market for a long time. What sets this line of research apart is the focus on these tail events. And um, we don't assume, for example, that risk is normally distributed. Now, that's a technical term. Um, what the normal distribution implies is something called the bell curve. And the bell curve has thin tails for outcomes. So it basically means that risky things are unlikely to happen, and it means that risk is very easily measured. So you can, if you think that risk follows this bell curve, you can f almost fool yourself into thinking that you you understand everything about risk, when in fact there are these rare events that are out there, not that far out there. They're still we see them in the Great Depression, um, but they can have an important part effect on stock prices if you introduce them into investors' beliefs. I'm looking into links with the macro economy. Um, so employment and unemployment is my um, biggest focus right now. So we're writing down a model that can explain why um, unemployment and job vacancies are so volatile, even though consumption itself is very smooth and why these things might track the stock market, because recently they have tracked the stock market. And a big part of it is, like investing in the stock market, investing in hiring is something where you need confidence that the economy is going to be stable going forward. If you lack that confidence, you don't want to put forth this investment.